Church, it's good to have you with us today. I can't wait to get the message. This is going to be a great message. You're going to have to stay with me. We're going to be coming at you from Luke chapter 6. If you want to go ahead and get there, get there. We're talking about the Sermon on the Plains, and we understand the plains if you're from West Texas. It is hot outside. It is dry outside. It has been windy outside. It feels like you're standing in a in a hairdryer. Right. And so we understand the planes. And here's Jesus. He comes down to a level spot. And the reason why I share this scripture with you is because if any time in my life where people, Christians especially, need to learn how to stand on the level, the level word of God, it's today. In Luke chapter 6, verse 17, we're going to start here. Luke chapter 6, verse 17, it says this. Jesus came down with them and stood on level ground, a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples that were there. You remember uh, his disciples were there, but also uh, others. A great throng of people is what the scripture says from Judea, Jerusalem, the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon. Last week, Matt kept us on level ground. He talked to us about what it means to judge and, and what they meant in their day and time with judgment. And I want to thank Matt and the incredible job that he did presenting the Word of God last week to us. And also, I want to thank his wife, Lindsay, all they do for the youth group. If you didn't hear that message, go back and listen to that message. You'll love it because it's short. All right, so go back and listen to that message. Great job, Matt. It's good to have you as part of the team. Today, I want to talk about the very foundation, the foundation of our lives and the life of the church. We know that Christ is the cornerstone, but people are attempting to build to build the church without consulting his word. They're trying to build their own lives outside of the word of God. And guys, that does not work. There's a reason why we have the scriptures. There's a reason why we have Jesus. The reason why we have the Holy Spirit is for this reason that we will build according to his kingdom, not a kingdom of our own. You know, I grew up singing a song, and some of you will remember this hymn. It's called, The Church is One Foundation. It goes, The Church is One Foundation. It's Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is His new creation by water and what? The Word. From heaven He came and sought her to be His holy bride. With His own blood He bought her, and for her life He died, or for her sake he died. Man, it's a, it's just a great, great hymn that reminds all of us the importance of God's word that really we as church members, we as the body of Christ have a great responsibility. When Jesus tells Peter, Peter, you're the rock at which I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail over it. Matthew chapter 16, there's something else going on there. He gives him the keys and it's the keys to the kingdom, meaning that you have a responsibility now as a follower of Jesus Christ, to be responsible to Him and His Word. It's critical, church, that, that we see that the foundation of the church must be the Word of God. And we're going to talk about that today, but we're going to, as we start in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, what we're going to look at here first is kind of a statement by Jesus. Jesus says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Why do you, why do you listen to me? and yet not apply what I'm teaching. You see, let me stop here for a minute because the term Lord in their day and time was a term of endearment. It was a term of respect. It was common in the day of Jesus, but it was highly misunderstood. We see Peter misunderstand the word Lord. As a matter of fact, there's a time where where Peter rebukes Jesus, and at that time he calls him Lord. He says, Lord, uh, it cannot be as you say. Listen, if someone is Lord, they are master, and we're not correcting them. It is their job to correct us because our job is to serve, is to do what they say, not for us to correct, right? And so Peter makes that mistake. And you know what Jesus says? He says, get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, you're trying to do things in your own power, in your own will, with your own, in your own ways, and that's not okay. You see, a Lord has servant, servants or slaves. You don't rebuke a master. Even Peter, if you remember when he rebuked Jesus, uh, he said, Lord, may it never be. And as I said, um, Jesus was not okay with that. He, he calls him Satan right there. So when we call Jesus Lord, we're not here to correct him or correct what he says or correct his word. We're here to listen and be instructed by him. In verse 47, he says, and for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He doesn't say everyone who comes to me and hears me. 
He says, there's going to be those who hear me, and there are going to be those who hear me and actually do what I say, right? And he says, I'll show you what they are like. So let me step up here for a moment, for a moment and just talk uh, very quickly about hearing. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the words to hear Oftentimes, as a matter of fact, the majority of time in Hebrew, when you read those words to hear, they actually mean to obey. So obeying should go with our hearing, especially if he's Lord of our lives. This is so important. You know, in the Greek, the word hear, it actually has a hyper prefix in front of it. And it, it basically means to hyper listen, to hyper hear, to have a hyper ability to understand and that that understanding would lead us to doing. It's, it's a cool thing. And so basically, uh, to hyper listen means that we will hear the word of our Lord. We will protect the word of our Lord and we will do the very words of our Lord. Now, here we go in verse 48. They're like a man building a house. So Jesus says, okay, there's a couple of guys here. Right. And here's those who apply the word. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And the book of Matthew talks about building on the sand. Right. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. In other words, it was devastated. It was done. So Jesus is speaking about building a house here, and this is how important the foundation is. There are two men with three things in common. They both built a house. They both heard the word of the Lord. I would say this, that maybe they, they were evangelicals. They both heard the word of the Lord, and the third thing was they would both go through the storm. Now, let me ask you a question, church. What reveals the storm or what reveals the foundation? What kind of foundation? It's the storm. So basically what Jesus is saying here is that a storm is coming. There are going to be storms in our life. And what's going to reveal the type of foundation that you have and what you're built upon is how you manage the time prior to the storm. Did you listen to the word of God? Did you do what the Word of God says to do? Were you a part of being those who apply the Word of God to your life and to the life of the church? Right? In Matthew, when Jesus speaks of this same thing, one of the thing, things that, that he made and, and pointed out that was different is that one was wise and the other was foolish. This tells us that not only a wise man can hear Jesus, but also the foolish can. And these two men wanted the same thing, but they, they, they went about it very differently in their lives. Just know a fool is one who knows what to do, but he does not do it. Let me say that again. A fool is one who knows what to do, but doesn't do it. It's, it's the difference here. See, wisdom, let me tell you about wisdom for just a moment, church. Wisdom is the ability to apply what you know. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge, and I share this with the men at Bravehearts all the time. There are those out there that know so much more than me, but they do, do they know the one, right? Do they know Jesus, and do they apply what they know according to his principles, according to his ways? Do they just call him Lord, or do they show that he truly is Lord of their lives? Because the difference between knowledge and wisdom is simply that, church. Knowledge is the ability to know. Wisdom is the ability to apply what you know. And the willingness to do it as well. It's what defines a wise man. It's the difference between a wise man and a fool in Scripture. You see, wisdom goes far beyond our education. Wisdom is the ability to not only hear, but of course the ability to apply what we hear. And sometimes it's not quick. Sometimes it must be developed or it's developing, but I want you to hear something. Uh, it's not quick to build upon the rock. It's, it's not quick. It's why Jesus didn't say, go get them all saved. What does he say? He says, go and make disciples. It's going to take some time. They're going to have to hear. You're going to have to show in your own life and instruct in your own life how to apply what you learn, how to apply the principles of God. We all want the quick fix today. We all want someone to snap it and build it. 
right? It's not going to be long before they have snap-built houses. I, I truly believe this. They just snap them together. You know, as a matter of fact, I remember when I used to build models as a kid. I loved getting models for Christmas. I loved getting models for my birthday. They would get me the 1978, 1979 Trans Ams, right? You remember the 1979 Trans Am? This isn't really part of my message, but there's something that's really special about that car, especially the black ones. You remember Smokey and the Bandit? Yeah. Uh huh. And so I remember when I no longer had to glue them, they came out with the snap tights and then I could just snap them together and it was quick and it was easy, but they weren't near as strong. They didn't take near as much time to build, right? As we build disciples, as we make disciples church, uh, it takes some time. And, and, and as you're building and as you're being built, as your foundation is being laid, don't get frustrated. I mean, the blessing goes to those who persevered, the perseverance of the saints is so important for all of us. And so we're building something. God is building something in us through his word and it takes time and it takes discipline. It, we, we've got to open and be instructed and learn. And sometimes it doesn't settle well with us, but you've got to hang in there and keep going. See, that's what makes us wise according to God and God's kingdom. You know, hammering into a rock for a foundation is going to take a while. To build on the sand, just go clear it and build it. But to hammer into a rock, you've got to carve out those edges. You've got to get everything just right. It's critical because everything's going to come up that way. Have you ever built something only to find out after you had the walls in and had it up, it's not square? I've done it a lot. I like to weld. I like to build horse sheds, uh, uh, small buildings, whatever it is. And there are plenty of times if I didn't have that foundation completely square when I started putting the tin on, what happens? There's a great overlap. Your foundation is critical and it takes time to get it right. It's not hard. It's not difficult. It just sometimes takes more time. It's going to be expensive. It's, it's going to be labor intensive to carve out in that rock. It's going to cost you a little something. You know, Jesus makes it clear that whoever comes after him, him must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow him. And there's a reason for that church. It, 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 it takes some time. It's going to be expensive. It somewhat takes work. You know, in this situation, one was wise. The other was foolish because of what? It's because of where they started, where they began. So many people want to get there quickly. So we read the, the self-help books. We, we read this author who can summarize it so much better than we feel like we ever could instead of just going straight to the Word and learning to study the Word of God. Now you might want to start with the book of John. I would start in the New Testament and I would begin to look at Jesus' teaching. Matthew 5-7 through is a great place. It's going to reinforce what we're talking about today in Luke chapter 6. Right? I, I tell people sometimes start with Luke and go to Acts. Those two are, are written by the same, right? They just come in together just like this. And you hear the story of Jesus and his disciples. But here's the thing. Don't be in a rush to get it all so quickly. We're in a rush to know. We've got to know. We've got to have the answer. We've, we, we, we're looking. And, and what Jesus is saying, no, take time and do it right. Let my word become enriched in each and every one of us. Let God's Word. See, one must bust the rock, break it down to the point of level, which means to chisel down to the very margins of the foundation, every corner, every square inch. It's similar in our lives, but the sand is so much quicker. But it's not the right way. It will not endure in the storm. And remember, church, remember this. What reveals the type of foundation that you have is the ability it has to go through the storm. That's what's going to reveal where your foundation truly is and where it's laid. See, the foundation that Jesus is speaking here is the foundation of his word. In order to move from a house to a home, we must have a solid foundation. And church, that foundation for us here at Harvest Connection, it's for us in our personal home, the word of God applied. That's what happens here. We want the word of God applied in our personal homes. We want the word of God applied in the corporate meaning of the church. Remember, one was wise, the other was a fool, simply because where they started. And let's be honest, when people want their situations addressed today, we oftentimes don't start with the Word of God. We don't preach or teach that the Word of God is supposed to be the foundation for our lives, for our families, for our churches, and for our nation. One nation under God. 
right? We live in a day when the Word of God is no longer the foundation. When people want to address their situations, they don't want to start with the Word of God. They start with psychologists, their own knowledge, their own books. We reach out everywhere else instead of reaching out to the one who made us, who created us, who has a plan and a purpose for our lives. You see, with these two men, biblical information was not the issue. Let me say that again. With these two men, biblical information wasn't the issue. They both had it. They both had the information. They both had the education. Jesus has just spoken the best sermon ever, really. He's laying some things out here, right? They both heard the difference was the one who chose to apply what he heard. And the church should be the same way. Right? Many churches start with man, with the theologians, with the psychiatrists, the psychologists, the doctors, the lawyers. And many are attempting to build or rebuild on a different foundation. Many are trying to change the foundation that this very country has started. Because you know what? If you want to change the future, you need to erase the history. A lot of times that's, that's, that's how you change the future. Let's just erase it so the next generation doesn't even know it. And by the way, you will never find that scripturally among nations. As a matter of fact, with the Israelites, the Lord was, was very specific about writing the Word of God on the minds of the children and on the hearts of the children. We are told first in Deuteronomy to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus says that's the greatest commandment. We're to pass that on from generation to generation. And nations are lost when we no longer look, whether the history is good or bad, when we know it, when we know it, we can build upon it to make it better. And this nation needs to come back to Jesus and His Word. In church, we should have never let it leave. That's another great caution here. We should have never let the world define what truth is. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is why He tells us to build a firm foundation so that when the storms come, when different ideologies come and go and they, and they go, we are the ones that are standing on level ground because we have the truth. And we are to give that truth to others so that they have hope for their circumstances, for their life as well. See, with these two men, they both had the information, but only one chose to apply it. You know, we're challenged in so many ways today. Uh, gender identification. And yet we don't have to be challenged in this. But I know pastors that are challenged with, well, you know, I don't know if there's really just two genders. Yeah, the Scripture says there's two. It simplifies things. You know, sexual orientation. Well, the Scripture is very clear. Be fruitful and multiply. That's male and female. He made them. And that's all He made. A racism, a different color, but really only one race. The human race. You know, in our politics today, my goodness, if Christians think it's interesting to me because we're to be called one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. You know, I stated this uh, about a year and a half ago. I preached the message out of Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus is talking about this same thing and, and how the foundation has to be laid upon the rock, the very word of God. And, and I went back and went through those notes, and, and they're very similar to what we have today because we're basically talking about the same thing. But uh, that April in Washington, the Washington Post stated over 90 American Muslims year before last, nearly all of them Democrats were running for public office that year. Joe Biden, I just saw a video of him attempting to get the Muslim vote, and he states, we all have the same roots. Basically, he's saying we all have the same foundation. It's not true. That's not true. Look, I don't hate Muslims, and some of you will interpret this message this way just because that's what I just said. I just said we don't have the same foundation. We don't. We have a different foundation. Non-believers have no foundation. Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Nazism, they all have different foundations. Even those evangelical indolence, honestly, you have a different foundation. You're trying to lay down a foundation outside of the Word of God or make the Word of God what you want it to be instead of changing our lives to what it, mean, what it means to follow Christ, His ways, and His Word. And there's a danger, no doubt, a critical danger. We wind up tickling the ears of man 
instead of understanding that we are to be here for Christ and Christ alone, for His kingdom to come. That means that He is Lord and we are not. See, Joshua Joshua stood before his people and he said, I'm going to tell you something. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Joshua 1.9. We've got to make that choice. Is God's word enough for you? Is God's word where we feel we can embrace and be encouraged and it is deep enough, written deep enough within us that we can endure the storms of this life knowing that there is an eternity that awaits? That's, that's who we're supposed to be. You know, I want to tell you something, church. The first point this morning as far as applying this message is this one. Build while you can. We enjoy our freedoms right now. We enjoy what we have right now. We enjoy the ability to do what we do when we want to do it. We enjoy the opportunity to go to work from 8 to 5 or whatever your job is. We enjoy the freedoms that America has. But when they are gone, you should have built when you could. There's a great warning out there. We've got to build while we can. There's a great fight over this nation. There is no doubt. There's, there's a great fight over the church and, and where the church and what the church is supposed to be in today's culture. And I'm telling you, we are to be the kingdom of God and we cannot change the word of God. We cannot change our Lord. He is our master and He reigns in His kingdom, and we are to honor Him, and we do that as we study and read and apply His Word to our lives. You see, I see a lot of proclaimed Christians who, who have been rocked by the storms of life. As a matter of fact, I've seen some walk away from the faith because during the time they could have built, they didn't. During the time when they could have been reading and studying and growing closer to the Lord, they chose not to. And when the storms of life rocked them, guess what? They were no longer there. They were just, their house was gone. And this is why Jesus calls us to build upon the rock. And we need church to build while we can. You know, a time of peace is a time of blessing. If you know anything about church history, you know about the Pax Romana. And the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, came at a time where the Christians really had an opportunity and an appetite to enjoy and appreciate the Word of God, and to learn and to study and to grow nearer to their Lord. And the gospel was propagated throughout all the land. It's important that we don't take advantage of the time that we can build. Build while you can. The other thing I would say, and I said this in the Matthew chapter 7 message, and I thought this was so critical to us understanding the importance of the Word of God. And my second point is don't mix rock and sand. Don't mix rock and sand. Now, I know we mix it in our concrete sometimes and that type of thing, but there is no doubt that when you're mixing rock as a foundation, when you've got rock laid out for the foundation, you don't want a bunch of sand in there where the rocks will move. And this is what happens with us oftentimes with the Word of God is we try to mix it. We try to make it a little more sweet. A couple of years ago when my daughter was in Mary Poppins, they sung a song in there, and, and you'll remember it. You'll remember just a spoonful of sugar does what? You probably remember it from my message because I know all of y'all were tuned into my message a couple of years ago when I preached. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down or makes the medicine go down. I don't remember exactly how it went, but okay, it went something like that. Now, here's the thing. We oftentimes do that with the Word of God. It doesn't always fit in our concepts, in our theological paradigms, or even outside of that, just in our worldly thoughts. It's, it's messing with our spirit man inside of us, and it doesn't necessarily fit. You know, I like fondue. I like to go and take, if there's a fondue machine, it's, that's a deal that melts chocolate, right? And you take a, a strawberry and stick it in there, and it tastes so much better that hot chocolate goes over. But here's the truth. Strawberries are good for you until you put a bunch of sugar on them. Sugar is an inflammatory. It's what's wrong with most of us is we have too much sugar in our lives. Everything's so sweet anymore. And now we try to sweeten the gospel of Jesus Christ. We try to sweeten up his word to make it go down a little better. Look, just preach it. Just teach it. Learn to understand it. Learn to obey it. Learn to keep Jesus as Lord, right? And this is... This is so important for all of us. Don't take the Word of God from its purity. Don't try to dip it into something and make it go down a little easier. 
That's not how he intended it. Matter of fact, there's a great warning in Timothy about us doing that. Don't do it. You see, the purity of the Word of God is just what it is. It's so good. You see, the danger when we mix both the world and the Word and we try to make it a little easier to go down, it confuses the house. It will confuse the house you live in as well as the house of God. It will confuse the nation. Who are these people? Be who you're called to be. Learn the Word of God and live out the Word of God in your life. As Joshua said, it begins in our house. You know, the Word of God has all kinds of things about raising children, about every circumstance and situation in our life. It's there, and it's for each and every one of us. It's a gift to us. You don't have to mix it with something else to make it sweeter. You don't have to go and read all the books. Read the book and watch what God does. And the third thing is the third point I I said in Matthew chapter 7 is that one day a storm is coming, and that storm is going to reveal your foundation. I'm telling you, the old saying's right. You're either just coming out of a storm, you're in the midst of the storm, or a storm is coming. That's life, right? And here's the, they, they, they say this, they say you can tell how high a skyscraper is going to be by looking at the depth of its foundation. And they start where? They start with a foundation on that. And this is important. Our foundation must be deep. It must continue to get deeper. It doesn't just get a certain, get to a certain place and stay. God is calling us to go deeper with Him so that we can bring His kingdom to this earth. That's our whole responsibility. In this world, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might have trouble. He said you will have trouble. He said, blessed are you that are persecuted because of me. There's going to be persecution because of Him. But we don't have to water down His word for that. We don't have to live any different. We bring His kingdom here to this earth. A storm is coming, church, and it's going to reveal the depth of our foundation. And and it's important for us during a time of peace to be deepening our foundation, to be carving out, to be building upon the pure Word of God. You see, when you understand the power of God's Word, you don't have to switch books. Every time you make a decision to follow the Word of God, you know, sometimes the, the Scripture tells me, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Yeah, but you don't know what she told me today. I I need to make that a little sweeter. That's kind of hard to do. Well, the one that needs to adjust is not the Lord. It's me. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Well, I don't like that. You know, one time I once had a lady tell me this. This is this is no lie. We're in our office doing some marriage counseling and everything. She said, "You know what?" She said, that scripture that says, uh, respect your husbands as unto the Lord. She said, if he acted like the Lord, I could respect him. (laughs) Well, how's he going to act like the Lord? Or what if he just gave him the respect and maybe that would win his heart? There's something in scripture about that written to Timothy, right? Maybe it might just win his heart over to the Lord where he started living his life according to the word of God and loving you as Christ loved the church. See, we make all these excuses of why we don't instead of why we do. God is looking for those who will apply His Word because that lays the foundation. Look, not just for this life, but also the life to come. And I'm going to tell you something, church. If I had a fourth point, and I don't, I'm out of notes. But if I had a fourth point, this is what I would tell you. I would say, discipline yourself to hear and do the voice of God. To read His Word. You know, Paul reminds us, discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is of little profit, but godliness is profitable in all things because it holds the promise for the present life and also the life to come. He's saying, look, it's going to make a difference in this life and it's going to make a difference in the life to come because you're going to have an ear that's attuned to your Lord for eternity. And eternity starts today, church. What does your foundation look like? You know, I'm told to love my enemies, and that's tough for me. But I also know that there must be a way because Jesus said it. It's not in my strength. It's got to be in His strength. He tells me to give. He tells me to love. Do not judge. And see, when we learn to apply those things to our life, we deepen the foundation and we ready ourselves for the storm. We, we in some ways... Uh, batten down the hatches, right? 
So some of us are simply tired today. Look, you've been chiseling rocks. You've been trying to lay this foundation, but you're tired. You are exhausted. It looks like you're losing in life, but you're not. Every time you chisel that rock to lay the foundation, other people see it. And you encourage their faith. And this is why we are not to neglect the gathering of God's people because it's a place of encouragement. It's a place where we can be lifted. It's a place where we can step in and spur brothers and sisters in Christ on. It's, it's a way of broadening our foundation. So, so don't give up. I want to encourage you, if you're one that's been chiseling in the Word of God and you can't see it in your life, others do. Because the Word of God does not return void is what the Scripture says. It makes a difference every time you open it, you study it, and you apply it. And this is why, look, and this is what we're called to be as the church. To encourage, to embrace, to say, hey, don't go it alone. You know, the disciples, Jesus, He didn't call one disciple. Twelve, right? They had one another. But Jesus was also there with them, and He reminds us, church, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them. You know, some of you have mixed rocks and sand. There's no doubt. Some of you are saying, oh, man, Curtis is way too conservative for me. Well, fine. I may be. But what you're saying is God is. He has a way He wants us to live this life, and He doesn't want us to mix rocks and, and sand. You know, here's the thing. Um, you're probably really more tired of watered-down results. What if you went all in this morning and said, I'm going to get up in the mornings and I'm going to read His Word and I'm going to pray and I'm going to expect to hear God speak to me and I'm going to make a difference in the culture that I'm serving. I'm going to bring His kingdom to earth today. Today marks a new day. I'm no longer going to be satisfied with watered-down results. God called me for such a time as this and I'm going to make a difference. Because I'm going to hear His Word and I'm going to do His Word in the life that He's given me. What if that's you today? I hope it is. And for, for all of us out there today, listen to me. You don't need to take a spoonful of sugar this morning. You need to take a spoonful of His Word. You know what His Word says. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Church, He is good. He's given us a gift in His Holy Word. He's given us a gift in His Rhema, in His spoken Word, right? In the Scriptura. Look, we have the opportunity to hear Him. And I would tell you, take that opportunity now and deepen your foundation. Church, it's been good to have you with us this morning. Know this, we are praying for you and we hope to see you soon.